up everybody? John the Morgal here, checking in for Unt video. And um, you know, this one's gonna seem way off the wall for most of you guys, and well, most of you guys are crazy anyway, so it doesn't even matter. <laughs> like nothing's off the wall to y'all for sure. I'm just gonna read um this is a video, it's regarding uh arch archangels or archangels in Islam and the Ib Abrahamic tradition. Uh, the channel's right here, it's up on screen, it's searching for Islam. The spirit doesn't have um, races or colors or creeds necessarily, you know. Let me just read this to you guys because it really resonated with me on a number of levels and uh, hopefully y'all don't um, shoot me in the face, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, so here we go. Oh. Blessings be unto y'all, by the way. Love you guys. All right, here we go. So, <clears throat> the uh, the Archangel Gabriel was... Uh, oh, by the way, this is the introduction here, and it's uh, basically they're going over the uh, Archangels in the different traditions, of course. So, the Archangel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth in Galilee, according to the Christian tradition, of course, to the Virgin Mary, proclaimed, enunciated to her that she had been chosen by God to bear Jesus. She asked how that would be since she was not yet married to Joseph and was still a virgin. The angel replied that she would conceive through the Holy Spirit. In Christianity, the Annunciation is the revelation to Mary, the mother of Jesus, by the archangel Gabriel, that she would conceive a child to be born the Son of God. The Christian churches celebrate this with the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th which is nine months before the Feast of the Nativity of Jesus, or Christmas. The traditional location of the Annunciation is the town of Nazareth, where is currently located the Church of the Annunciation. All right, so here we go. Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. Uh, pretty, pretty nice one. Very beautiful. The Annunciation, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she will bear the prophet Jesus. I'm just reading here. I'm, I'm narrating, so don't judge in the words that I say. All right, so i got to pause it here. All right, so, quoting from this uh, interesting text here. Angels are God's mercy, and as per the belief of Muslims, they accompany the mortal at every step. They shade their wings over saints and martyrs. They have different occupations. Eight of them carry the divine throne, or the arsh, Yet, their main duty is constant worship. There are two angels, the Karamun Katabain, who sit on the human being's shoulders to note down ac uh, actions and thoughts, and there are also 19 under the leadership of Malik, who are in charge of hell. Before the creation of man, Allah created first the angels which were made from light, and angels have no free will, and the jinn from the smokeless fire. And I think it's worth mentioning that um, according to this, according to their uh, religion, which I'm not saying that I subscribe to, but it is very interesting according to, you know, just, just juxtaposing it with some other uh, veins of research that I've been into here lately, um, it is noted that the jinn, According to this, do indeed have free will, but they're made from different stuffs altogether than the angels. So anyway, later when uh, God created Adam from clay, he ordered the beings in his presence to prostrate to Adam. So all the angels did so, save Iblis, a jinn, who did not. And so Iblis is the one that Christians might call Lucifer, right? So Iblis was proud and considered himself superior to Adam since Adam was made from clay and he was created from smokeless fire. For this act of disobedience, God damned him to hell for eternity, but gave him respite till the day of judgment at his request. So Iblis obtained permission from God that he would use this time to lead all men astray to burn in hell. And Okay. All right, so angels in Islam are light-based creatures created by God to serve and worship God. Belief in angels is fundamental in Islam, without which there is no faith. Whoever does not believe in any of these is not a believer. Allah, or God, peace be unto him, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, 
and that predestination, both good and bad, comes from God. Okay, so it says here, they are intangible, sentient entities who don't have a free will. Their purpose is to serve God. Being made of light, they can assume almost any form, completely real to the human eye, and traverse a distance just as fast as light, or maybe faster. And when they said sentient, there's an asterisk, and it's basically constantly awake and attentive. So, while Iblis, or, you know, Lucifer, if you want to juxtapose that, uh, did disobey God, was expelled from heaven, and became the avowed enemy of man, he was a jinn, not an angel. Jinn are different from angels, according to this, since they are made of smokeless fire and not light, and they indeed have free will, and can disobey or openly defy God. Okay, so Iblis appears more often in the Quran as the Shaitan, a term used to refer to all the evil spirits assisting Iblis, you know, or Lucifer, whatever, uh, but which is often used to refer to just Iblis. Iblis is mentioned 11 times, and Shaitan, or Al Shaitan, is mentioned 87 times. Uh, he is chief of the evil spirits, and in some ways his personality is similar to that of the devil in Christianity, although there are significant differences. The uh, Quran does not depict Shaitan as the enemy of Allah, for Allah is supreme, or God, you know, the Most High, is supreme over all his creations, and Iblis is just one of his creations. Hence, in Islam, Shaitan is the enemy of man, and I guess we could infer here, uh, you could add in parentheses, uh, not necessarily the enemy of God. Um, and again, I'm not saying I'm agreeing with this, but I'm just, th that's what you can sort of infer from these texts, right? And I know this is not the Quran summation, but uh, the point, I believe, is still valid, right? All right, so non-Muslim scholars generally hold Iblis to be a contraction of the Greek word diabolos, meaning devil. Uh, they claim that the Christian and Jewish communities of Arabia during uh, Prophet Muhammad's time, which again, that would be like, you know, about 650 uh, common era or Anno Domine in the year of the Lord, right? They claim the Christian and Jewish communities of Arabia during Prophet Muhammad's time are likely to have known the word from Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible and the Gospels. And um, I think that's probably a valid point. Right? Muslim scholars, on the other hand, are more inclined to derive, uh, back to the quote, derive the word from the Arabic verbal root balasa, meaning the despaired. After all, is not Iblis who is worthy of being stoned and whose respite will end on the day of resurrection be in despair? In modern and late medieval Christian thought, Lucifer is a fallen angel commonly associated with Satan, the embodiment of evil, and the enemy of God. Uh, Lucifer is generally considered, based on the influence of Christian literature and legend, to have been a prominent archangel in heaven prior to having been motivated by pride to rebel against God. When the rebellion failed, Lucifer was cast out of heaven along with a third of the heavenly host and came to reside on the world. There is no standard hierarchical organization in Islam that parallels the division into different so-called choirs or spheres as hypothesized and drafted by early medieval Christian theologians. Uh, most Islamic scholars agree that this is an unimportant topic in Islam, especially since such a topic has never been directly mentioned or addressed in either the Quran or the Bible. Um, I will mention, however, that uh, certain Gnostic texts actually go very deep into that sort of thing, uh, as well as uh, things like the Book of Enoch. Anyway, I'm just pointed out that uh, some of the some of the Gnostic texts indeed go into great detail about the hierarchy of these uh, fallen ones, or maybe you could say jinn. I'm not going to say that one's created a fire and one's created a light, but you know I'm not going to say that that's not true either. Right? Who knows? I will attest to the fact that, uh, well, I'm not going to say the word believe. What does that even mean? But I know for a fact that there is truth to this, you know, about angels in general, right? So anyway, back to the quote. However, it is clear that 
there is a set order or hierarchy that exists between angels defined by the assigned jobs and various tasks to which angels are commanded by God. Um, the general consensus agrees that archangels are the highest order of angels as those are the ones named the most in the Quran as well as the other books and that would be Gabriel, Michael, these are considered to be uh, closest to God in terms of servitude as their meaning and purpose is more detailed than any other angel. Uh, these are other, uh, other angels mentioned in the Quran. First would be Malik. Uh, in Islamic belief, Malik denotes a terrible who guards the hellfire, assisted by 19 Zabaniyah or guardians. In the Quran, uh, Surah 4377, Malik uh, tells the wicked who appeal to them that they must remain in hell forever because, quote, they abhorred the truth when the truth was brought to them, end quote. In another verse, quote, they, the people in hell, will cry, oh, Malik, would that your Lord put an end to us, end quote. You got another one, it's uh, Ridwan. Arabic is a bunch of squiggly lines that pretty, but I don't know what it says. J-A-N-N-A-H. Okay, Islam, Jana, Arabic, Jana, plural, Janet, Turkish, Senet, uh, literally paradise garden, it's the final abode of the righteous and the Islamic believers, but also the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Hawa dwelt, is called Jana. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so uh, maintaining the Jana, uh, he's similar to the angel Malik in charge of Jahannam, which... All right, so here's another one, Karamun Katabin, or Karamun Katabain. Uh, honorable recorders uh, are two angels in Islam who record a person's good and bad deeds that decide if one is sent to the Jannah or to the Jahannam. All right, so these two angels are mentioned in Surah 82, Ayah 11 of the Quran. Okay, so Nakir and Munkar, another are the angels who interrogate a person in the grave about his or her good and bad deeds. Uh, Nakir and Munkar, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, and in Arabic uh, the word is a bunch of squiggly lines that are very beautiful. I don't know what they mean. So in Islamic, uh, eschatology, eschatology uh, are Malaika, it's my cousin's name, believe it or not, uh, who test the faith of the dead in their graves. After death, a person's soul passes through a stage called Barzakh, where it's stored near the grave. Even if the person's body was destroyed, the soul will still rest in the earth near the place of death. The angels prop the deceased soul upright in the grave and ask three questions. Who is your Lord? What is your way of life or your religion? And who is your prophet? A righteous Muslim will respond correctly, saying that his Lord is Allah, and his way of life is Islam, and depending on what time period he lives in, uh, he will uh, say his prophet as Muhammad. A voice from God will resonate down into the grave, confirming what the person said was true. He or she will then be shown a window to the place he or she could have had in hell but are then showed the place that Allah has given for him, or God has given for him or her in paradise. So then there comes to him some of heaven's breezes and fragrances, and the grave will expand into a comfortable space as far as the eye can see, and his grave will be lit up. The righteous believer will then remain in a state of bliss until the ayama, or the day of resurrection. All right, a non-believer will respond incorrectly, and the angels will rebuke him. Quote, Neither did you know, nor did you seek guidance from those who had knowledge, or who had Islam, or who had gnosis, or understanding. End quote. So they will then show the soul the place he or she could have had in paradise, and then show that person his or her eternal place in, quote-unquote, hell. Right? So then he will be hit with an iron hammer between his ears, and he will cry. And that cry will be heard by whatever living being approaches him except human beings and jinns. That person's grave is tightened until his ribs come over each other like clasped 
hands, and here she remains in a state of torture until the resurrection. Again, hey man, not saying I believe this, I just think it's very interesting because, you know, I just must comment here that the parallels between the Muslim understanding of heaven and hell and the Christian understanding of heaven and hell are practically identical. This, the, uh, I mean, everything's the same about it. I mean, clearly it's an Abrahamic religion. Um, and, you know, the reason that I'm making this video is, again, it's not because I'm converting to Islam. However, I think it's very important that we understand um, that the Islamic religion has been very much demonized in our culture. And the fact of the matter is, it's practically identical to the uh, so-called Christian or Judeo-Roman uh, religion. And um, honestly, I'm not attacking anyone's religion. And I'm certainly not trying to merge religions. Um, frankly, I, I don't even think that the uh, so-called Christian and uh, so-called Jewish Gospels belong in the same book. Um, but it is just a, just a point I need to make, and yes, these sorts of caveats are necessary. Alright, so, the Quran also mentions angels who occupy the realms of the seven hells. A verse stipulated this, quote, O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire, or a Jahannam, whose fuel is men and stones, over which are appointed angels, stern and severe, who flinch not from executing the commands they receive from God, but do precisely what they are commanded. And that is from At Tahrim 66.6. All right, praise be to God, who created out of nothing the heavens and the earth, who made the angels messengers with wings, two or three or four pairs, and adds to creation as he pleases, for God has power over all things. And the subtext here, and that is from Fatir 35.1, uh, subtext here, the preceding sentence does not imply that all angels have two or four wings. Most notably, archangels, namely Gabriel and Michael, are described as having 600 wings. Tradition also notes that certain angels created solely for the purpose of praising God have 70,000 heads, each with 70,000 mouths that speak 70,000 languages solely to sing praises for the Most High. All right, so, end quote. <laughs> There are four archangels generally recognized by the Muslims, and that's Jibrael, Azrael, Michael, and Israfil. Dejebril, or Gabriel in English, <coughs> pardon me. Jibrael is the archangel responsible for revealing the Quran to the prophets. It says, of course, the prophet Muhammad, but I would say that it is really all the prophets of, in all these books. Um, and, you know, I'm not even attesting to uh, the truth of any, of any of these books, and I'm certainly not attacking the truth of any of these books. One thing I will mention that it is, it is Gabriel that is responsible for revealing the truth to many, many prophets, uh, verse by verse. So, uh, Gabriel, the archangel responsible for revealing the Quran to the prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, verse by verse. The Quran names him as Ar-Raw al-Amin, I know I butchered it, sorry, the faithful spirit, and as Ru al-Quds, the Holy Spirit. Jibreel, also known as the angel who communicates with all the prophets that Muslims accept, he is mentioned specifically in the Quran. Okay, Azrael, so Arabic, uh, it's a bunch of squiggly pretty lines, uh, typically known as one of the names of the angel of death and is an English form of the Arabic name Israel, uh, the name traditionally attributed to the angel of death in Islam, although the name Malaikat al-Maut, which is a direct translation of the angel of death, is usually used in the Quran. So it's also spelled Azrael, Ashrael, Azaril, and Azrael. The name literally means, whom God helps. Okay, so Azrael, along with his helpers, is responsible for parting the soul of the human from the body. Uh, yeah, so the actual process of separating the soul from the body depends on the person's history or record of good or bad deeds. If the, if the human was a bad person in life, the soul is ripped out very painfully, but if the human was a righteous person, then the soul is separated like a drop of water from a glass. 
So Azrael was first known as Azra, the descendant of the high priest of Aaron and the scribe of the Babylonian exile in Second Temple Jerusalem period. During the early Christian period, he became known as Esdras, the prophet who bears witness to the coming of Christ. It was this early Christian story that claimed Azrael descended into heaven without tasting death. And depending on the outlook and precepts of various religions in which he's a figure, Azrael is portrayed as residing in the third heaven. Uh, according to this, he has four faces and 4,000 wings and his whole body consists of eyes and tongues, the number of which corresponds to the number of people inhabiting the earth. Uh, he will be the last to die, recording and erasing constantly in a large book the names of men at birth and at death, respectively. Okay, so when the angel of death came to Moses and said, Give me thy soul, Moses replied, Where I sit thou hast no right to stand, and the angel retired ashamed and reported the occurrence to God. And again, God commanded him to bring the soul of Moses. The angel went, and not finding him, inquired of the sea, of the mountains, and of the valleys, but they knew nothing of him. Really, Moses did not die, according to this, through the angel of death, but through God's kiss, for God drew his soul out of his body. Solomon, prophet Suleiman, peace be unto him, once noticed that the angel of death was grieved. When questioned as to the cause of his sorrow, he answered, quote, I am requested to take your two beautiful scribes, end quote. Solomon at once charged the demons to convey to his scribes to lose where the angel of death could not enter. When they were near the city, however, both scribes died. The angel laughed on the next day, whereupon Solomon asked the cause of his mirth, Quote, because, answered the angel of death, you send the youth to the place where I was ordered to fetch them. End quote. And that was from S-U-K or Suk 53. Oh, there's a subtext here. I guess I better read that. The ancient name of a royal, uh, and that was Luz, the ancient name of a royal Canaanite city connected with Bethel or Israel. It's a city uh, of, uh, in ancient Israel about 10 miles north of Jerusalem. Its location is generally identified with the modern Palestinian village of Beatun in the West Bank. Mikael, or Michael, or Mekael, is one of the four archangels. Uh, some Muslims believe that he is all covered with emeralds. He's charged with bringing thunder and lightning to the earth. He's also in charge of the distribution of nourishment to all creatures. He taught Adam to answer the greeting of peace with the words uh, Wa Ramatu Alahi Was Barakatahul. It is alleged that Mikael never laughed <coughs> after hell was created. The archangel Michael, referred to in the Bible, Daniel 12, verse 1, is considered a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. September 29th is the feast day of the three archangels, saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. The archangel Michael, referred to in the Bible, Daniel 12, verse 1, and book of Revelation 12, 7, is considered a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. September 29th is the feast day of the three archangels, saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. In late medieval Christianity, Machael, together with St. George, became the patron of chivalry and the patron of the first chivalric order of France in the order of St. Machael of 1469 in the British honor system. A chivalric order founded in 1818 is also named for these two saints, the order of St. Michael and St. George. That was the name I, I rep St. George Church when I was a youngin. Right, whatever. Um, so... Uh, according to both the Jewish and Christian traditions, um, Michael's name was said to have been the war cry of the angels in the battle fought in heaven against Shatan and his followers. We have a little picture here. Uh, Guido Reni's Archangel Michael in the Cappuccino, Cappuccino Church of Sta Maria. I'd like to go there. I bet they got some banging, <sighs> banging Java you know, around the 1600s. So this would have been um, this would have been painted before, right around the time that uh, that Muhammad, peace be unto him, was walking around, according to this. 
Okay, so Israfil or Israfael or Israfil or Raphael, okay, is not directly mentioned in the Quran. However, according to the Hadith, Israfil is the angel responsible for signaling the coming of Judgment Day or the Day of Resurrection by blowing a horn and sending out a blast of truth. It translates to English as Azrael or one of the similar names. Blowing of the trumpet is described in many places in the Quran and all those other books too. The first time it will destroy everything, 69.13, and second time all human beings will come to life again. Alright, so Raphael. In Judaism and Christianity, Raphael performs all manner of healing. The Hebrew word for a doctor of medicine is Rophi, connected to the same root word as Raphael. The name of the Archangel Raphael appears only in the Deuto, uh, I'm sorry, Deutero-Canonical Book of Tobit. In the Book of Tobit, he first appears disguised in human form as the traveling companion of the younger Tobias, calling himself Azarius, the son of the great Ananias. During the adventurous course of the journey, the Archangel's protective influence is shown in many ways, including the blinding of the demon in the desert Upper Egypt. After the return and the healing of the blindness of the elder Tobias, Azarias makes himself known as the angel Raphael, one of the seven who stand before the Lord. Okay, so while this video is really just a scratch on the surface, uh, such a brief introduction into the presence of the very same trusted messengers of the Most High found within the Torah, the Quran, and the Roman Bible is clearly abound. Uh, the intent of this piece is simply to make the case for some striking commonalities found within these texts, which, for all intents and purposes, is worth investigating. Uh, if for no other reason than for the sake of the truth, but also for the animosity between the children of such so-called opposing doctrines, is a shameful deception, as we are all woven of the same spirit, we are all beholden to the Most High Creator of all, we trust in the grace, wisdom, and majesty of the eternal Creator. We all rest our faith upon similar spiritual pillars. And the trivial differences between jots and tittles is beneath the spirit of our universal Creator. I can speak with authority on at least one point, as I have been guilty of carrying prejudice against allegedly alien and false doctrines without applying even a scrap of diligence to, uh, you know, even glance at these teachings for which we rebuke our brothers and sisters. This is, of course, the definition of ignorance for rejection of any idea or line of inquiry without inspecting its tenets binds us in ignorance and only prevents us from unforeseen avenues towards the ultimate goal, which is the truth. This is not to say that we should abandon our moral compass nor blindly jump headfirst uh, into complete subscription to unfamiliar doctrines, uh, far from it. But if we lack the spiritual flexibility to merely consider potentially uncomfortable avenues of inquiry, we risk becoming stuck in divisive cultural quagmires, yoking ourselves beneath meaningless banners, yet we remain blind to the single most important clique which is the Holy Spirit of wisdom, truth, and love which abides within us all. In spite of the perfect oneness which we unknowingly share with our so-called enemies, our spiritual adversaries have twisted our blatant similarities into confounded contention between we, who are brothers and sisters, sharing the image of the Spirit of the Most High, yet have been led so far astray from the truth that we do war against ourselves. We would do well to remember that the Master charged us with essentially loving our so-called enemies and praying for those who would wish harm and curse us. Considering the wars of aggression bearing terrible atrocities under the sons of Abraham in the name of Christ, this nation of mystery Babylon is clearly not walking the path attributed to Yeheshua Hermeshiach, although the woefully faithful body of the modern church will be prone to attack such sentiment. The systemic injustice and ravenous politics of the greater land of modern Canaan are being subsidized by our delusional support for poisonous dogma above the love of our kin or even our charge towards peace, truth, and forgiveness. 
The purpose of my testimony here is not to assault anyone's faith, although if their faith is so feeble as to crumble upon examination of contrary views, then it seems not to be resting upon a solid foundation, for the faith delivered by the one true creator does not flee from inquiry, but blossoms within us under the miracle of the discerning spirit. On the other hand, the intent here is also not to promote one flag or another, but simply to highlight the fact that pre-programmed xenophobia instilled into the culture is unwise, and it couldn't hurt to at least examine any prejudices we may harbor against the kindred spirits of our brothers, for it seems we are not as opposed as many have been led to believe. At this point, it seems obvious that our geopolitical trajectory is unsustainable in practically all metrics. The inhumane and violent injustices hurled against the sons and daughters of Abraham by the sons and daughters of Abraham have been a bane unto the world for quite long enough. Senseless violence cast upon our spirit from our very spirit is folly indeed. And for what? For the sake of pride, ignorance, bigotry, and zealous subscription to dogma? This is both illogical and antithetical to the character of Yeheshua, who preached truth, love, and forgiveness above all else. There will surely be misplaced animosity towards this message, although I pray that the Most High bestows a flexible and discerning countenance upon the embers of truth sparked within you by the grace of the mysterious creator of all things physical and incorporeal. The most important thing I must relay to you is my gladness during this season of uncertainty, revelation, redemption, and secret blessings upon high which no man nor angel has dreamt. The spirit of the Most High is not concerned with the petty squabbles between the grasshoppers which delude themselves by irrelevant matters of this world, nor is the eternal spirit concerned by things of the flesh which binds our souls to the matrix of our poverty. The promise of revelation is being poured out to us in great measure, just as promised, and as such, it is only necessary to praise the Most High, Creator of all things, whose grace and majesty extend beyond the grasp of these vessels. Yet we are gifted by His limitless grace to understand our place, which is permanent and powerful, yet we have never seen it with our eyes. Be assured of his gentle mastery above and within all the realms of the worlds and heavens, and his love for the Holy Spirit which will never die, but will indeed consume the bonds of our prison, which many believe is the all, but they do err. The pillars of the unnameable spirit transcend the corporeal world, but we are given glimpses of the undying realm through the prophets who are charged by the Father of Truth to utter syllables of his great poems and blessings. His word, which is pure energy, will never be written in a book, but it is found within you. While the messages delivered to this realm are sacred indeed and perfect in their time, the word is hastily molested by the great deception of this temporal world of decay, for within a realm of deceit the truth is indeed despised above all else. The purest state of the perfect word is at the point when it is bestowed upon the elect, although words do not justice to such matters of spirit. The process of compressing such concepts into mere babblings of men is the first point where the immaculate and permanent word does lose some measure of its luster. Then, when the word is spoken by the mouth of the flesh and heard by the ears of the flesh, a loss of purity is also suffered unto the word. Thus. The purity of the word is but a shadow of the main line granted us from the Most High to his prophets, who are not bound to race, color, or creed. At the point where the truth's umpteenth generation is retold among the prideful and jealous flesh, then printed in a book, the purity of the word does flee from us. For this world is the world of decay and hollow intrigue, where even the purest ideas will rot along with the pages of any book. While the word is perfect, immaculate, and perpetual, any pages penned by men and filtered through the precarious tracks of history become a fragment of the original intent of the author, who is blessed above all men and above the heavens. When the pure truth is spoken among the deep realms and the realms upon high with full potency and authority, the heavens and the world will thus fall away. The authorities of this realm, and of the heavens, and of the depths, were perfectly reclaimed by Yeheshua after his work. This was a great miracle, and the ramifications of this are not fully understood, or appreciated. But when the prophets do return to this realm in pure unity, with the Most High, their work will be finished. 
And while I cannot say exactly what role the Prophet Muhammad plays in this mysterious saga, it seems unwise to shun those whom the breath of God does dwell, or at least that's the way that it appears. So anyway, uh, just food for thought. Thanks for watching, guys. God bless. Peace. And don't forget to consider supporting the channel here, should you so choose. Uh, these times are uncertain for everyone, though your help is needed if you can spare it, and it is greatly appreciated. One love, and I'll put links in the scripts. All right, guys. Bye.